the substructures of thought. So for you, like you know, we talked about Piaget a bit, and we said for Piaget, you kind of built your brain from your body upward. Brilliant idea. It's so smart. But Jung, Jung has a lot of Piaget in him. It's, it's more implicit. But for Jung, not only was your the substructures of your thought biological, and so therefore based in your body, but your body was also cultural and historical. You know, so partly because you're, you're an evolved creature, and so God only knows what's in there. 3.5 billion years worth of weirdness that you can draw on, or that can, that can move you where it wants to move you. But also, you're being shaped by cultural dynamics all the time. And human beings in particular, like we're just watching each other like mad all the time to see what we're up to, what people think of us, how we should be behaving, are we being boring, are people attracted to us? It's like we're social right to the core. And, and that's another way that you can understand an archetype. It's like part of the archetype is that we are social to the core. So we're interested in other people. And more if you're extroverted and less if you're introverted. But it doesn't matter. By, by the standards of, say, solitary animals, we're so social, it's just unbelievable. And so that's built in. It's built in. What's built in is that you find that interesting. That's the archetype. The archetype is whatever it is that makes you find that interesting. It's beyond your control. Like, if you're extroverted, you're interested in people. You didn't decide that. It decided it for you. The question is, what is it? Well, it's your brain... Your brain, your limbic system, whatever the hell that means. Like, we don't know what that means. You know, we have no idea how your brain produces consciousness. Like, I'm dead serious. We haven't got a clue. And what that indicates to me, since we've been hacking away at it for, say, 400 years, is that the way we think about consciousness is wrong. Because we're not getting anywhere. Like, we've got a long ways with lots of things. We're not getting anywhere with consciousness. Okay, so back to the archetype. So, Because I, I can tell you how these things arise to some degree. So you're interested in other people, say. And so you're interested in them because they're unbelievably useful resources, right? Because they know things. They have resources that you want. Plus, you want even subtle things from them. You want their attention. You want to play with them. You know, you, There's all sorts of things that you need and want from other people. So the social interactions are incredibly valuable and informative. But the information is interesting because part of what... Every single person is constantly broadcasting to every other person is how to behave. So now, if you meet someone and, and let's say you find them interesting, well, I can tell you that the more ideal they are, assuming you're not too warped, the more ideal they are, the more you're going to be interested in them. Because that actually is what defines ideal. Like, as you become ideal, you could say that is also the same as becoming high status. As you become ideal, then you're interesting to people. So that's interesting, because that, what that means is that you can read off people's interest to find out when you're deviating from the ideal. And they don't even know what the ideal is. The ideal is that to which their attention is inexorably drawn. And they're always telling you when you should fall short of the ideal. Always. It's being broadcast at you all the time. And then your imagination back there is to try and figure out just what is this ideal? You know, because your imagination is watching you in a Piagetian sense, noticing what you do, and then trying to figure out what that is. <coughs> so you'll have fantasies about the ideal. That, that often happens in, in a romantic relationship, especially at the beginning of it. Because, you know, you, you project your idealization onto the person that you're romantically attracted to. That's the projection of an archetype. So Jung would say, the woman will project an animus onto the man. The animus is her conceptualization of what the ideal man is. It's unconscious because it's rooted in fantasy. And the man will be in concordance with that projection in some areas. That's, those are the areas where she likes him, by the way. And will be discordant in other areas. And that's the areas where she constantly dis disappoints him as the relationship develops. So the, the projection is there in part to help the person understand who it is that they're dealing with because when you meet someone, you have, to, you have to assume something about them. It's the same as projection. You have to assume something about them. And if you find them fascinating, which is what happens if you fall in love, maybe it's because they smell good or they're symmetrical or something, you immediately assume that, well, those things really matter. You immediately assume that they embody the ideal. It's an oversimplification. But the oversimplification has a basis. 
And the basis is, if it's interesting to me, it must be close to the ideal. Well, yeah, except the person that you're going out with, attracted to, is warped and bent and flawed and twisted in, you know, 300 ways. And you'll find that out soon enough, just as they will about you. And that often just blows the relationship into bits, because the person will say, well, she wasn't who I thought she was. It's like, well, who said, whoever said she was who you thought she was? It's like, where did you get the misapprehension that she was going to be who you thought she was? God, what do you know? You know, you're led, you're led around by your sense of smell and your ability to detect symmetry. It's like, that's, yeah, that's not very sophisticated. So those are, those are, so the anima and the animus are two primary Jungian archetypes. And they're very complex, but that kind of gets at the surface. Um, the ideal that I was describing, so people are broadcasting information to each other, which is, be ideal, be ideal, be ideal. Be, it's like, be my ideal, obviously. But let's say, let's say if, if I took a thousand ideals and then averaged them or extracted out the common ideal, the ideal that was common to all of them, that would be a savior figure. That's what a savior figure is. And then now, now and then someone comes along who acts quite a bit like that. And poof, you've got yourself a religion. So do not be thinking that these images that people fall around, like, like, you know, like, what, bloodhounds on a trail. Do not be thinking that those things are like conscious cognitive constructs, like conscious cognitive constructs, like Marxism. They last like 50 years and they kill 100 million people and then that's the end of that. A good religious system, man, that will keep a culture going for like 3,000 years. And even at the end of it, it doesn't disappear. We know that the story of Horus and Osiris, for example, drove Egypt, like Catholicism drove Europe, for like 3,000 years. That's a long time. And then it turned into Christianity. So it's not like it disappeared. Actually, it sort of transmuted into Judaism and then turned into Christianity. So it's not like the ideas disappeared. They, they didn't disappear at all. And believe me, you're just as possessed by them as any ancient e Egyptian. It's just that you're more fragmented and conflicted because what your unconscious assumes and what your conscious mind assumes aren't the same thing. And so you're, like, you're all at war with yourself. And that's partly what makes you attracted to like moronic ideologies, by which I mean any ideology, because they're all, they're all false idols and false gods, and they're shallow. They're shallow and deadly, and they ruin your life. They destroy your soul. So that's a, just a catastrophic response. And that's why it's so terrible to have that discordance between your instinctual being, your deep instinctual being, and your little fragile, you know, half-witted conscious mind that sort of thinks it's in control. It's like, you're not in control of anything. Believe me, the best you can do is follow what's right. That's the best you can do. We, I mean, we even know this neurologically to some degree. If you look at the hypothalamus, it's a little part of the brain. We'll talk about it quite a bit. It's sort of where the Freud, Freudian id resides, to the degree that it resides anywhere. It's this collection of nuclei that do things like make you hungry or make you thirsty or make you, you know, sexually desirous or um, make you defensively aggressive or make you terrified of an intruder who... who who threatens your dominant status. It's this little tiny part of your brain. It's hardly even there at all. It has massive projections coming up into the cortex. And then there's little tendrils going down to regulate. And so basically, as long as everything is pretty much perfect, your conscious mind is in control. But as soon as things deviate from the path to any degree whatsoever, the really smart parts of your brain take over. And then you do what they tell you to do, or you suffer the consequences. So you see this with people who binge eat, for example. Or sometimes people develop a condition called polydipsia, which is all often a consequence of hypothalamic damage attendant on a stroke. And they'll drink water till they die. You cannot stop them because they, they're ragingly thirsty, like someone who's starving. And like, you can say, well, you've had enough water. It's like, no, that is not going to cut it. <laughs> it's not going to cut it. You're, you're not getting anywhere with that. And you see the same thing with people who have like obsessive compulsive disorder or something like that. When they're not in the grip of the disorder, they're perfectly normal. You get those people to touch something they don't want to touch. It's like they're not the same person the second they do that. And whatever they thought of themselves, you know, the, the self that was supposed to be in control, that bloody thing is like, it's 
it's like a wagon with a child in it being towed behind an elephant. There's just, it's got no control at all. So you have to, one of the things that's terrifying about you is that there, there's no escaping the realization of the nature of the forces that are behind the puppets that we are. You know, in Pinocchio, that's why Pinocchio is a puppet, right? Something's pulling his strings, he's a marionette. And the things that are pulling his strings, well, they might have his best interests in mind, but they might not too. And so that's what Pinocchio is about, actually. It's also about how not to be a mannequin. It turns out that you have to go to the bottom of the ocean, find your father in a whale, and then drown. That's how you stop from being a puppet. It's like, and you think, well, you don't believe that. And I would say, well, yes, you do. You went and watched the movie, and you enjoyed it. Not only that, you understood it, even though you don't have any idea what it's about. And also, on the face of it, it's absolutely absurd. It's like, it's not a puppet first, it's a drawing of a puppet. So that's weird. That like that's two levels of weird, and then like what the hell's with the cricket? Where'd he come from? You know, and what's what's his role? And why is he the conscience? Why does he get like activated by a fairy? And why is the fairy a star? It's like you're in there, you know, like Cletus the slack jaw and you watching the screen, <laughs> captivated by it, and you know, you walk out and you don't even notice that. You're so peculiar that it, it's just beyond belief. You don't even notice that that's so peculiar. It's like, what the hell are you doing in that theater? Watching this marionette follow a bug around to, an egg, to a whale. It's like you walk out, and, oh, that was so touching. <laughs> <laughs> really, like really, people are really crazy, you know, and, and, and weird. Like we're like rhinoceroses or, or platypuses or ostriches or penguins, we're weird right to the core and when you start to the weirdness is so deep and so ancient that st even starting to touch consciousness of that just it just rocks your boat so but it, but one thing or another will rock your boat so sometimes it's nice to choose what, what thing it is it prepares you for things too so i'll tell you part of what the know means you know he's a marionette Anybody can pull the strings. I mean, he's got a good heart, but what's that worth? Nothing. Virtually nothing. Because he's naive. You know, you can manipulate. It's the fox and the, what is it, that stupid cat that manipulate him, right? And basically, behind them, you'll see the devil, because that devil pops out quite quickly in Pinocchio. And he's the thing that's behind all the local manifestations of evil that are trying to pull Pinocchio's strings. He gets blown off the right path pretty badly almost turns into an unconsciously brain donkey who ends up working in the slave mine, which is exactly what happens, by the way. You know, to, that's what happened to devout communists who found themselves swallowed up by Stalin's nightmare in the 1940s and 1950s. Well, then you're so good. You did everything you wanted. It's like, yeah, well, it turned out what you wanted is for you to die painfully. So, you know, congratulations. So, you know, and that's brilliantly laid out in Pinocchio, which in fact was written in 1930. Brilliantly laid out. It's, it's way, it's way more intelligent analysis of the 1930s than anything you'll ever find that was written. So, Pinocchio, you know, he's trying to cue the proper path, and he learns that he shouldn't lie. That's a, that's a, what we call part of it. I'll tell you why that is later. And it turns out that in order to get out of the horrible mess that he's put himself in, partly by being an, an un, a slavish adherent, adherent to momentary pleasure and nihilism. You know, he ends up half a jackass who can't speak properly without braying. So that makes him an ideologue. And the only way that he can get out of that is to go down to the bottom of the ocean as deep as he can possibly go. Deeper than anything is willing to go to find his father. What's his father? His father is the culture that he lost touch with. You know, and to the degree that you guys are lost, like all human beings are lost, the reason you're lost it's because you've never rescued your father from the bottom of the ocean. You haven't gone deep enough. You won't, you won't have even known it was necessary. It's necessary. You're a social, historical, cultural creature. Right down to where you become a biological creature. And if that isn't part of you, and if that part isn't functioning properly, then you're, you can just be blown off course by the wind. There's nothing to you. You're not grounded in anything. That's partly why the shaman, when they go down, communicate with their ancestors. That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to pull up the cultural understructure of their, of their societies up into consciousness to make use of it. And you, you constantly have to have a dialogue with that because 
you know, I say, say your background, just for the sake of argument, is Jewish. A lot of the lines of, of you know, the culture that you're embedded in was written down by people several thousand years ago. It's like it's not easy to figure out what the hell those people were talking about or why it's relevant to you. So there has to be a dialogue continually going on between the present and the past so that you can bring the wisdom forward without losing what's in it. Because if you lose what's in it, it's like you're just nowhere. You know, I see this all the time in my, in my practice. You know, often it happens to people who get divorced or who are living together and not married, which you think, well, you're free. It's like, you don't want to be that free. You know, you want to argue with your partner about every single thing for the rest of your life? Well, that's what you have to do if you don't let your culture guide you. It's like, there's no rules. Go ahead, make up all the rules. See how easy that is. Christ, that'll kill the average person in 10 years. It's just such a weight when you only have one life. You know, you might as well let some tradition guide you so you have some peace some of the time. Or you'll end up divorced and with children. It's like, uh, you, you, that's cancer for lots of people. They get divorced, they have children, they get locked into a custody battle, and they're done. That's the end of their life. They're ruined by it. So you step outside of the guidelines of your culture at your own peril. And modern people, because they're so coddled, think, oh yeah, well, we can handle it. It's like, sure, you can. You wait till you get there. You'll find out that you can't handle it, and it'll be too late. What'll, has, what'll have happened is that you know, the whale that you were supposed to go confront and rescue your father from has risen out of the water and taken you down, and you're done. That's chaos. So these are serious issues. Like Jung, I would say, is the most serious thinker of the 20th century. He was so, he was so serious that the pseudo-serious people who read him just bounce off him. They don't even know what the hell he's up to. So Jung was one of those thinkers who was addressing questions that most people don't know exist, like at the bottom of reality, and who was also answering them. So he's a twofold blow to the intellect. First, he tells you that you're so stupid, you don't even know what's wrong. You can't even ask the right questions. And then he answers them. It's like, That'll, that'll uh, do in your intellectual pretensions.